The reason why I'm making this video is because I've never really found satisfying explanations in textbooks for why a Michelson interferometer has a bullseye pattern for an interference fringe. Sometimes you find these hand wavy statements such as the beam is rotationally symmetric about its axis, therefore it has to be a round interference pattern. The beam is normal to the mirrors, therefore it's a round interference pattern. All these hand waving statements are unqualified. In fact, I would dispute that they're correct. Interference happens where the beam is recombined, and it's recombined at the beam splitter, which is rotated, so it's not normal to the beam. And the symmetry of the beam is broken by that rotation. So I really don't think that rotational symmetry or normal incidence on mirrors is the reason why you have a bullseye pattern. I looked into it using simulation software and I'm going to show you what I found. The simulation of a Michelson interferometer in ZMAX Optics Studio involves two mirrors that are at 90 degrees from each other and a beam splitter that is tilted at 45 degrees. The recombined beams land on the detector down below forming whatever interference pattern there's going to be. Laser light is incident from the left. It passes through this weakly diverging lens. So weak you can't see the curvature in the drawing. Its refractive index is currently set to 1 so it's not diverging at all. The light source is set to Gaussian because it's a laser. I gave it 10 display rays and about 300,000 analysis rays and a beam size of 10 millimeters. So I'm assuming that beam spreading has already happened. The splitter requires using file splitter.plb and giving it a glass BK7. Mirrors are these rectangle objects. And then the detector is just a rectangle detector today. And it has a dimension of 15 by 15 millimeters and 100 by 100 pixels. If you use more pixels than that, it can get kind of noisy look at what's on the detector screen and see if we have fringes. Well we have that and what is that? It might help to change it from false color to inverse grayscale. What you're looking at is the Gaussian distribution of laser light inside the beam. It's brightest in the middle and it tapers off. There are no fringes. What is it about this beam that gives us a pattern out on the detector screen that mimics the appetization of the laser beam itself instead of giving us interference fringes? Well, the simulation beam was like this one, perfectly collimated. You can, in principle, divide the beam up into millions of different beamlets and just follow them through the beam. They're going to strike the mirrors and the beam splitter at different points, recombine, and go to the detector. With a perfectly collimated beam, all of the beamlets are perfectly parallel to each other. They strike the beam splitter and the mirrors and they come back and they recombine and they give you this. I know that because that's what we just simulated. But a real laser beam is not perfectly collimated. The beamlets aren't perfectly parallel to each other. As you move out from the center of the Gaussian laser beam, the angles the beamlets make relative to the horizontal optical axis increases, simply because the beam is very, very slowly diverging. The consequence on the Michelson interferometer is that when beamlets that are farther out from the center of the beam recombine, they've traveled a different optical path length. Follow the beamlet that is right in the center of the beam. It reflects off of the beam splitter, hits the mirror, perfectly normal to it, reflects back right along the same beam, and recombines with the beam that went through the beam splitter and reflected back, and heads off to the detector. But a beamlet that was farther out from the center strikes the beam splitter at a very slight angle, meaning that it reflects off the beam splitter and goes to the mirror and does not strike the mirror perfectly normal and reflects back from the mirror to the beam splitter. And meanwhile, the beamlet that went through the beam splitter does the same thing. And they have a changed optical path length as a result of that very slight angle caused by the lack of collimation. If we look up close at where this first beam, call this path one, strikes the mirror, compared to a perfect normal, there is an additional amount of path length, call it delta L1, and delta L1 grows as rho, the radial coordinate from the center of the beam, grows. The central beam doesn't experience any change in optical path length due to poor collimation, but farther out you go, the bigger that gets. So this change in the optical path length to the beamlet that follows path 1 will be larger if the beam is more poorly collimated, or it will be larger if you just move out from the central ray. Look over at path 2, and you have the same phenomenon. The beam will have a different optical path length. Now, its change in optical path length, I'll call it delta L sub 2, is not going to be the same 
as the other beamlet, in principle simply because path 2 is a shorter path than path 1. And so delta L, the change in optical path length due to the pore collimation, is going to be different. And the difference in those changes in optical path length is the altered optical path length difference between the two beams when they recombine. And that altered optical path length difference grows with rho, and it also will grow as collimation gets worse. And now I'm going to change that lens from an index of 1 to a refractive index of 1.52. So it's just like that at BK7 that the beam splitter is made from. And you can see the effect in the simulation. Light hits this lens and it diverges. So it's no longer collimated like it was before. The detector shows us this. Now we have fringes. So the bullseye pattern is achieved when the collimation of the laser beam is not ideal. Even though the beam strikes the mirrors perfectly normal and strikes the beam splitter at a 45 degree angle. Try instead to keep the beam perfectly collimated, but adjust those angles so that one of the mirrors is not being hit perfectly normal, or the beam splitter is not being hit at a perfectly 45 degree angle. Another soft experiment involves removing the lens, which we do by changing the refractive index from 1.52 to 1. And we go back to just having the Gaussian beam, no fringes. So I'll do one more thing. I'm going to rotate one of these mirrors. Oh, let's say about the y-axis, a very small amount. doesn't have to be much because the beam has already been spread. If the beam spreader were after the interferometer, it would require much more of a tilt. Now let's look at it. Now we have these vertical fringes. And if I made the beam larger, the optics larger, there'd be more fringes to look at. But they're vertical. These are your fizu fringes. They're a consequence of the mirrors not being perfectly aligned. And that's why normally when you work with a microcin interferometer, it's a lot easier to get vertical fringes because it's very difficult to align mirrors. In either case, the bullseye fringes or the fissure fringes can be used to do the same metrology because if you change the relative optical path length of the two legs of the interferometer, the fringes move the same amount regardless of which type they are. If I change the amount of that tilt, let's see how it does to those fringes. Now they're more closely spaced, and more tilt, and they'll be even more closely spaced. And that's why you typically see some very closely spaced vertical fringes on a microsin interferometer instead of a nice bullseye.